Welcome to the Awaken Beauty Podcast. I am Cassandra, your organic beauty, positive mind management, and endocannabinoid mentor. And today, we are definitely going to be talking about some key topics as women that you want to key into. We're specifically bringing back Julie Tebbin, and Miss Julie Tebbin was with us in two previous episodes, one of them in which we discussed the very premise of what functional medicine is and what to expect when going to a functional medicine practitioner, as well as the other episode after that was about our hormone hierarchy, the very cascade of hormones that we have, how to optimize them so we can feel our best. So the number one asset to hormones is that they are these beautiful chemical messengers that are communicating in our body and correlating with our organs and creating our mood, our skin health, our hair, all of these different subsets in our bodies. And if they're not working and communicating correctly, unfortunately, they break down. And many of us women today feel the effects of that. But today specifically, we're going to, Julie and I, nerd out on how these chemical messengers, our hormones, affect our skin and our hair health. Now, this is a topic all women will love because we are going to basically do a deep dive on what us women commonly go into and type into the oh holy google algorithm and we capture these quick tips or these snippets in a magazine article and we consider them truth and then they fall falsy to uh, them working for us and we just give up so there's many nuances many many uh parts of the puzzle that Julie will be able to put together with us here today, as well as myself with over 20 years of experience with working with women on their hair loss issues and optimal skin goals. There's just so much we're going to dive into. And it's beyond just what you find on Google or like I said, in that magazine article. So before we go any further, we are going to reintroduce Miss Julie Tebbin. And Julie is a certified nurse practitioner who specializes in the management of functional medicine and hormone imbalances in young women through women entering their menopausal transitional years. With a professional certification in women's health, Julie is also a certified practitioner with the Institute of Functional Medicine. Her clinic grew out of a deep, deep desire to focus on helping women live their best and their healthiest life. She's intimately understands the um, and empathizes with the plethora of women coming to her office, being discouraged and being told everything looks completely normal, leading them to a never ending internet search to find alternative approaches in which I keyed into on the intro of this podcast. So I want to welcome back Miss Julie Tebbin. Welcome back to the Awaken Beauty podcast. Hello, I'm happy to be here. Ah. Awesome. One of my one of my favorite topics as usual. Yeah, well, that makes both of us. And I think um, you know, women have all these different things going on with their hormones, but when we see it in our hair and we look at it on our skin, it's front and center and we want to kind of go at it at all aspects. So uh, Julie, we're gonna be discussing kind of three different key areas. And so awaken beauty listeners, you want to key in because we're gonna be talking about everything from one pendulum from estrogen dominance and over oily skin to postmenopause and menopause to dry skin and even vaginal dryness. Um, But we're also going to jump off the podcast with what we often land on as women, considering 50% of women or more have a thyroid issue and don't even know it. So Julie, why don't we just go ahead and jump into um, just the topic of thyroid imbalance and let's just kind of jump right in because this is a key thing that women always first probably bring up when they come to you as a practitioner, correct? Correct. Yeah. I would say a lot of people come in that have hair loss and they're, they're coming to me specifically to evaluate their thyroid because they've kind of keyed in on, on that as a possible correlation and they go to their doctor, their doctor does a TSH, their TSH is normal. Um, they might have a few symptoms of fatigue, maybe a little constipated, but yeah, everything looks fine. So no, it's not your thyroid. And 
in reality, what they're looking for is, do you have thyroid disease? And the truth is, you probably don't. You probably don't have thyroid disease, but you're not looking at thyroid function. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can, we can look at all of the markers of thyroid, TSH, um, which is basically your brain telling your thyroid gland, you know, ramp it up, slow it down. That your, your thyroid gland is predominantly producing a hormone called um, T4. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's looked at, but that's basically saying, is my thyroid making, is my thyroid gland making enough T4? And that's the predominant thyroid hormone that you make, but it has to convert into the active T3 to be useful. And that's, that's the, the true active hormone that deals with all the symptoms. Well, we, we rarely look at that. And we, you know, the, the, there's another pathway. T4 can go to T3. It can also go to something called reverse T3. And that reverse T3 is an inactive hormone. And they compete for the same receptor sites in your tissues, including, um, every tissue that is involved in thyroid, which is almost every, you know, tissue in your body. And it can block and make you somewhat functionally hypothyroid. So looking at the bigger picture of TSH, T4, T3, reverse T3, looking at that ratio of T3 and reverse T3, and then looking at all of the nutrients that impact that. Mm -hmm. um, T4 production is sluggish if you're deficient in vitamin D, if you're deficient in iron. And that, those are two big key areas. Your hemoglobin might be normal, but your ferritin might not be. And I, I kind of use the analogy, your hemoglobin is the money in your purse. Your ferritin is the money in the bank. You have a heavy cycle, menstrual cycle, and you've just depleted all the money in your purse. So if you have nothing in the bank, you're, you're iron deficient. So iron is a big one, and, um, but it has to be looked at beyond the hemoglobin. And so sometimes it's as simple as, hmm, you're just iron deficient, we need to get you back on some iron. Um, a good quality absorbable iron, we, we need to make sure you're absorbing it. And it could be as simple as that. It's typically not. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and, um, and so then we have to look deeper and we have to look at some of the other minerals, um, selenium, zinc, um, some of the B vitamins, um, and as I mentioned, vitamin D. Um, sometimes you have to look at fluoride. You know, if you're mm -hmm. exposed to a lot of fluoride, you brush your teeth every day with fluoride, you get your fluoride treatment at the dentist every six months, and you drink fluoride in your water. That antagonizes iodine, and you need iodine to make um, T4. So, um, so there's a lot of nutritional markers you can look at just to see if they're sluggish. Your T4 is probably on the low end of normal. That means that, okay, now I need adequate zinc and selenium and iodine to get T4 to T3. And then I need to make sure it's not going down that other pathway that we don't want to see. And that's where it gets more complicated. And I think we'll come back and talk about some of those issues later. But things like inflammation, infection, liver, kidney dysfunction, food sensitivities, stress, um, you know, not getting enough calories, um, and then, you know, just malabsorption syndromes, things like that. I mean, all of those things can affect reverse T3. And now that goes up, T3 goes down, and all the numbers can look fine. If we're, and if reverse T3 is elevated, your issue isn't that you need thyroid hormone. Your issue is that you need to get that reverse T3 down. You have to deal with all those functional issues. So that's probably the biggest one. And I usually start there. Then um, if- Can I stop you, know, you right there? Yeah, yeah. So I have a question. So- um, you know, I've had, in fact, yesterday, just yesterday, I had a client, she said, well, do you um, know of any practitioners and I'm, I'm taking um, selenium and I'm taking iodine for thyroid issues? Now, she doesn't really actually know that she has a thyroid issue, but she's presuming she has a thyroid issue because it's a genetic situation in her family and all of her sisters and her mother. And so I I've asked her if she's taking a synthetic iodine or she's taking a natural based iodine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I first started formulating Evoke Beauty Skincare, one of, one of my formulators is actually the most, has the most abundant raw organic food grade algae mm -hmm. and spirulina, which is a really, really high level of iodine in those mm -hmm. nutrients. And so you know, kind of like the pharmaceutical world versus even coming down to the macro micronutrients needed for sufficient thyroid production. Um, how do you support women if you find that there's a macro micro mineral, re you know, reduction in there? 
specifically, are we talking specifically about iodine or? Well, specific, let's just say with iodine, you know, because okay. women don't, eat, I don't think women know where to get iodine from and yeah. sources that they can get it from. So, you know, iodine, um, first of all, you have to be a little careful. I do, um, you know, the best way, there, there's, a, there's a lot of different ways to test iodine. I sometimes will just, if I'm, if I'm really suspicious, I'll just do a straight blood iodine level. And that mm -hmm. frequently comes back um, deficient. You have to be careful how much iodine you replace mm -hmm. if, you have, uh, if you have thyroid antibodies. Mm -hmm. And so that's something in an initial thyroid assessment, I'm always looking for antibodies. And if those antibodies are elevated, you probably don't want to be pushing iodine too aggressively. So dosing is kind of, um, you know, there's, there's products out there that you get, um, you know, 12 milligrams, 50 milligrams of iodine when a, a basic multivitamin would be about 200 micrograms. Mm. Um, so there's a wide range of iodine out there and you have to be a little careful if you're just taking it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it, this part of the country we don't have, I mean, we, we're, we're intercoastal, you know, that's yep. why Japanese women tend to have better iodine levels is because they're in an area where um, iodine sources just in the soil are better. So, yep. um, you know, iodine comes from, you know, getting into the foods that we grow in the soil. Um, but, you know, basically, if, if our iodine levels are okay, first of all, avoid the fluoride. Right. <laughs> I'll hate that I'm saying that, but avoid, I haven't used fluoride in over 10 years and I haven't had a cavity. I mean, there's right. no fluoride. Um, so, you know, be careful of that antagonizing um, fluoride because that will lower your iodine levels. Um, if you're taking a basic multivitamin, multimineral, and you're getting 200, say 200 micrograms of iodine, that's probably enough. Mm -hmm. um, 100 micrograms, 200 micrograms. Um, women who have a lot of fibrocystic breast pain, that's often an indication of iodine deficiency. And mm -hmm. then I might have them take a stronger support just to get that iodine level up. Um, as far as food sources, we don't, we just don't have a lot of food. I mean, yes, you can eat, seek, I saw it at Trader Joe's, you know, the, in the snack section, mm -hmm. the kelp. I really don't know how much iodine you get from, from those kind of sources, from sushi. I mean, there's pros and cons of everything. So you yeah, always have to say, you always have to say, yeah, it. just start eating a lot of this because yeah. there, a lot of that may be problematic in another area. So um, yeah, I think the key is, I mean, just throwing yourself on a high doses of iodine because you have a thyroid issue is probably yeah. not, not the best thing. And, and right. like you said, the antagonist and the things that block our production are probably, you know, the one part to thing. pay attention yeah. to. But again, I think this comes into what we'll talk about later in labs and things of that nature. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, going back to the introduction, going on Google and just finding all these different thyroid enhancers just isn't mm -hmm. really the solution to solving a thyroid issue in which maybe we can jump into kind of the next topic and, and yeah. this will play out and let's jump into, you know, estrogen and estrogen yeah. dominance. And that, that oftentimes is more about, um, you know, if we talk about uh, skin, mm -hmm. estrogen dominance is a big issue for, um, you know, premenopausal women, women in their 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, part of the biggest issue, and, and what estrogen dominance means, and we talked about this a little bit last time, is the issue that you're progesterone deficient or is the issue that you're estrogen dominant? And so mm -hmm. estrogen dominance means you're not metabolizing your estrogens well. So they're building up in your tissues. They build up in the fat. And, um, and so it's, it's all about detoxification, biotransformation and elimination of these estrogens after we're done using them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways, um, you know, that this can happen, but, you know, the manifestation in a person is they get very oily skin, they get acne, um, they may notice a, a certain type of, um, of hair loss, they may notice more hair growing on their face and their arms than on their head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so there's, you know, those are some of the issues. Um, I think another there. piece too is the fat load. So, um, you know, you carrying the fat, fat around yeah. the breast area, around the stomach area, around the back of the arms, um, yeah. you know, yeah. those yeah. areas and too. Typically, I, I've heard, you know, and I, this, I haven't really seen this, but I've heard that women who carry more weight around their hips and thighs tend yep. to be more, uh, have more issues with detox, but I've seen it, um, those with abdominal fat too. And the abdominal fat are going to be those that are going to be more, uh, where it's more associated with insulin, yeah. which can just be a basic insulin resistance issue or, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is very commonly, 
Um, it, it's a diagnosis that's been given to a lot of women and often just they're put on medications for the symptoms, but polycystic ovarian syndrome, I've actually heard of it called an autoimmune ovarian issue. Like we have autoimmune thyroid issues. You can have an autoimmune issue with your ovaries and, and it, it basically you have, um, uh, your, your high insulin is increasing your androgens mainly because you have a lot of insulin receptors in your ovaries. And then that triggers an increase in your androgen, like your testosterone production, testosterone, not many people know this, but all androgens, testosterone included, um, becomes estrogen or all of our estrogens come from androgens, I should say. And so when androgens go up, estrogens go up. When estrogens go up and androgens go up, a little hormone that's called a, a binding glob, it's a, it's a binding, globu binding globulin, sex hormone binding globulin, it's a regulator. And so when your hormones are going up, that starts to come down. So when you see really low sex hormone binding globulin levels, you know somebody's probably dealing with some of these insulin issues. And again, it's your way, it's your body's way of kind of managing the high you know, the, the, the hormone imbalance, but now your free testosterone is floating around and androgen levels go up and we basically cycle back. And, and so the insulin, um, you know, and like I said, sometimes it's PCOS, sometimes it's just insulin resistance. If people are just, you know, it's, it's a diet related issue. Um, you're sedentary, you have high stress levels. I mean, there's a lot of things that can, you know, there's, there's family history. Um, but you know, there's so many other correlations with people that have this type of high androgen issue. It can affect your fertility. Um, and, you know, and if you think about it, you have all these issues with how you're metabolizing your estrogens. Now you have infertility issues. So what's the treatment? We're going to put you on a bunch of hormones to try to help you get pregnant. That's something you're going to have to deal with now down the road. Um, you've built up a lot of this estrogen over time. Your, your detox system is really struggling to get this estrogen out of the body. And so holding on to all this estrogen creates this estrogen dominance. So that whole scenario can be very complicated. And, but it, it tends to be something that you would start to manage just by really cleaning up the toxins in the environment, those xenoestrogens, as we call them, um, the plastics, the bisphenol A, the... Um, you know, the certain chemicals and herbicides and organicides that we, we spray on foods, um, certain chemicals we spray on um, golf courses, um, and the list goes on. In fact, the Environmental Working Group website has a whole list of, um, it's the Dirty Dozen Endocrine Disruptors, um, and those are all just chemical estrogens. And so, you know, trying to lower that whole estrogen load right. is kind of the beginning. Um, yep. Look at your environment, look at what you're eating. Um, yeah, going and, back to the previous episode, Julie, I was really, yeah. really um, I, I really love the story that you shared about the young woman that was off to college and she was in her 20 something and her estrogen load was just so high. And, you know, to mm -hmm. kind of find out just all the skincare, yeah. and skincare that she was putting on, I'm sure mm -hmm. she had a ton of perfume, probably not eating the best diet and had all mm -hmm. of these Zeno estrogens flooding mm -hmm. her system. And right. uh, I've done two episodes. And so um, at the time that this airs, uh, listeners, you can go back and you can listen to the too many episodes that I did around this. The first one was uh, what are xenoestrogens and how they may be uh, a directly affecting non-weight loss, meaning you can't mm -hmm. lose weight. And the second one that you will find on the Awaken Beauty podcast is uh, where to find these xenoestrogens in your beauty products, as well as your everyday products. And, you know, things like parabens, phthalates, every single fragrance, as Julie said, plasticizers, mm -hmm. all of these things are found in virtually everything that women kind of interact with every day, whether they're cooking, drinking out of their water bottle on the go, or slathering all their beauty products. Now, the other piece that um, when we talk about estrogen dominance is estrogen release, meaning how do we detox these estrogens? Mm -hmm. And on that second episode, we also briefly just touch base on the detoxification pathways and just... If, if we're bringing in these xenoestrogens, if we have an abundance of them um, coming around and you know, rolling around in our body, how do we get them out? And one part is the liver. So mm -hmm. can you just give really short, a quick um, synopsis on how that, well, how we have to keep our liver in the utmost? Well, yeah. And, and so 
there's multiple detox pathways. And when I, when I talk about biotransformation and elimination, we have to turn these estrogens into, in fact, in the process. And when we talk about doing, say, a detox protocol, again, very, uh, there's a lot of them online and you read about a lot of them. And Fire some beware. Of them, some of them are real crazy. Yes. It's really all about, there's, there's basically two, three phases of how we detoxify and getting, you know, phase one creates a much more risky substance. Mm -hmm. And phase two is where we all kind of are sluggish. Mm -hmm. And so if we're going through this detox process and we're, we're pulling out all these estrogens in a fat soluble form, and we don't have the capability of getting that through phase two back into a water soluble form, mm -hmm. we're at risk. Well, then even if they're in that water soluble form, and let's say we're kind of constipated. I mean, there's a lot of constipated women out there. Normal bowel movements are at least two a day. If you're having one every other day, you're constipated. And if you are going through a detox and you're not eliminating a couple of times a day, now those, those toxins are recirculating into the system. So yeah. again, detoxification is something you have to be a little cautious about. It, you need to be kind of, especially when you're dealing with issues like estrogen dominance and you have all the symptoms associated with it. It's one thing to do a little detox protocol when you're, um, when you're pretty healthy and you're just kind of doing it for health maintenance. But when you're doing it to get rid of um, uh, you know, high risk substances, you have to just be a little cautious because you could actually be activating your, um, your liver even more, making it harder on your liver. And yeah. So, so I want to, I want to stop right there because it's really, really important, Julie, because this is something that you're an expert in mm -hmm. and you help women one understand. And number two, you have the tools to give them the right testing to make sure that mm -hmm. they have the support they need. So support I need, meaning do you have good liver function to detoxify correctly. And, oh, yeah. you know, that's huge. And so, um, you know, I had heard this analogy and I think it's so brilliant. And if you go back to, um, you know, I love Lucy and mm -hmm. you have Lucy and Ethel and they have all the bond bonds and they're coming down their conveyor belt and the liver, like, because of this, like, medium guy that has, you know, the, um, celery juice to detox your, your liver and all these different things that you can buy on the internet. We live in an age where it looks good, reads right. That's what I think I need. And we grab it and we go, but it gives us, it does more harm. So as you noted, the liver one, number one and two, to detoxify pathway, um, your liver has a lot of different functions and mm -hmm. it's, it's the center fulfillment, let's call it the Amazon fulfillment center of all these different hormones that convert. And it's, it's doing a lot of different things. And one, you need the correct nutrients, protein, energy mm -hmm. to get it to one into two. And as you noted, to get to two to um, water soluble for it to deplete out of the body. And this is the same with SS estrogens. Um, so back to this Luthi and Ethel, you know, they're sitting there and they're trying to wrap all the bonbons and they're coming down the conveyor belt. But essentially when women go and put these, like go on these intense detoxes or intense water fasts or calorie restrictions and you dump into your liver, so to speak, it's like the Lucy and Ethel basically trying to like pick up all the bonbons and then just like start stuffing them in their shirt and they're throwing them outside the sides of their hands and it's mm -hmm. like, it can't function. Yeah. And you then re-metabolize all these toxins or estrogens. And so I just wanted to slow down there for a second because women yeah. really have to capture the level of detail the liver does, mm -hmm. estrogen does, and well, you can't just go and throw yourself on a detox. Right. And, and I can get even more complicated there is we have several detox pathways. Yep. They're all genetically associated. They're all nutrient associated. Yep. The amino acid conjugation pathway is very dependent on amino acids or proteins. The methylation pathway is very dependent on B vitamins. Mm -hmm. And again, we can have genetic issues with all of these pathways. So mm -hmm. listening to a really comprehensive history and getting those clues in advance is, is really helpful because some people right. call it detox and they say, yeah, I didn't really notice anything. And some people get really sick. Mm -hmm. And, um, but for many, you know, they come out the other side feeling like, you know, they've, they've you just changed the oil in their car. Things are just running more smoothly. They feel like they're processing things a lot better, a little more clear, a little more energy, a little less muscle pain after exercise. And, and that just means that everything is, is getting through the liver 
in a in a more efficient manner. And and so you know estrogens we you know we talked a little bit about external toxins, but you know estrogens are kind of the internal toxins. If they're not managed well, um, your liver has to work on those just as much as it has to work on the external toxins. So that's why. Reducing the external load reduces the load on your liver because you still have to deal with those internal toxins. And, and so that's, you know, detoxification is one of the big ways that we think of um, uh, getting rid of kind of that high toxic burden. But, you know, back to the whole androgen issue, and I mentioned, you know, some women have the high androgens and there's that association. Um, you know, it's not just the estrogen detoxification issue. Um, and in those people, you know, eating more of a plant-based diet, a little, you know, more whole foods, um, actually getting soy in the diet can be really helpful. And when I say that, I don't mean go out and buy a bunch of soy milk um, off the shelf. I mean, you know, organic edamame, organic soy nuts. And I don't mean having a huge handful every day. I just mean how many of us are really actively eating soy? We all think it's bad for our thyroid. We all think it's, you know, it's dangerous. It's a phytoestrogen, but actually soy is good for um, uh, you know, in, in this kind of trying to, you know, block that androgen from turning into an estrogen. Um, white button mushrooms <laughs> are, are one thing that, that are, are a good thing to kind of help with that pathway. Green tea, we, you know, we drink a lot of coffee, but we don't drink a lot of green tea. There's a lot of good green teas out there. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to just kind of help, um, keep those androgens from turning into estrogens. But again, beyond that, we start to get into the insulin resistance issues. And then it gets a lot more complicated. But these are people that are going to have more of those um, androgenic and estrogenic side effects. And, you know, and that's going to affect skin health and hair health. So um, that's a that's pretty great. big that's a pretty big topic and it, and it goes in many different directions. Yeah. Yeah. The estrogen dominance is uh, so many causes and, you know, way, the way I see it is, you know, especially young girls hitting puberty, even and things of that nature, you've got mm -hmm. oil production out of control. I see it in a lot of women in their scalp. Um, I can usually tell by facial hair cause we do a lot of waxing um, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it can be pretty, once you see enough of the patterns of estrogen dominance, it can be pretty easy to pick up symptomatically. Yeah. So as much as we want to get into all of these different high level testing and figuring out the nuances, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. you can usually figure out if you're estrogen dominant on a lot of symptomatic and right. so changing from kind of the oily side, let's kind of switch over to the dry side. So, you know, we're kind of hitting into kind of this balance. We're having children. We're kind of in this kind of hopefully sweet spot with our hormones. We have a good sex life. We're having children. Hopefully our fertility is good. And we start to reach into menopause, you know, and so let's talk about boomers, the abundance of them and kind of some of what you see a lot of come into the clinic and talking about, um, you know, lack of. Right. So, right. And, and, you know, there's that whole transitional phase and a lot, a lot can happen. That's, that's where, you know, it's really tailoring um, recommendations between symptoms and what are our goals and, yep. and, you know, what are the things we need to focus on. But when you hit menopause, um, some women, it's just fine. Um, some women really don't have a lot of menopause symptoms, but they'll come in and they'll say, you know, my skin is just not as, you know, it just feels more wrinkly. It's more dry. Every, everything is dry. Vaginal tissues are dry. It hurts to have sex. Um, you know, they, it, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, they get more dry, eye dryness, more yeah. oral dryness. I actually heard someone, and I can't remember who it was, talk about um, just hydration in general. We need to hydrate a lot more during mm -hmm. this especially if you're having hot flashes too. And, you know, we think about drinking half, half of our body weight in ounces, um, but it's probably significantly more than that for women. Um, so making sure that you're really, really staying well hydrated and then making sure that you're, you're getting a good, healthy quality fats in your diet because yes. your, your skin is, is highly made up of fats. And, um, and, you know, so there are several ways to um, improve um, just skin health in general. Collagen is, is mm -hmm. important for that skin matrix. Um, and uh, the other one is uh, that I was going to mention was, um, let's see, collagen, um, fatty acids, and um, antioxidants. Um, yes, you know, a lot of oxidative stress in the skin. And so making sure you're getting some healthy antioxidants in your diet. 
Yeah, going into that a little bit deeper. So I think that those are three really fundamental nutrients that you're mentioning, Julie, because going back to, um, even going back to detoxification protein, a lot of women, I don't believe, get a lot of protein and accurate forms of protein. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, whether you're a vegetarian or you do eat meat, just... I believe women that are getting older, we need to kind of view our diet a little bit differently because as everything slows down, we need like the most abundant, quick and readily available nutrients so the body can build back up. So good sources of protein, fatty acids. We talked about a couple times ago that, you know, being somebody that formulates CBD, the endocannabinoid system is even larger than the endocrine system. And the number one thing that the endocannabinoid system needs is fatty acids. That's the, these endocannabinoids are what is lined in our uterus with CB2 receptors. So fatty acids, not only for skin, but optimal production of other hormones, um, cholesterol, you know, that as well. Um, And then antioxidants, absolutely, to kind of keep all of these oxidized um, you know, reduction in our body kind of squandering out the dead ones so that we can continue to renew and keep everything vital and taking out those antioxidants and free radicals, dis-ease, inflammation, and reading them from the body and letting them go down to that lovely detox two pathway in the liver. So, um, you know, with, with menopause, um, you know, from these, if you don't have sufficient, we've talked about skin loss, um, thinning skin, Um, women often like to go and put a bunch of fillers in the face. But what I find is we often disregard is that because the skin is slowing down and sagging and we're losing that muscle tone, um, the more you fill, the more when it comes back down, the more it's going to sag. And you're kind of creating this push-pull effect. Whereas if we really, really think about, and this is how we formulate Evoke Beauty, is you have to think about the fundamental building blocks of the skin. And that first is internal and then topical. So drink enough water, but then taking hyaluronic acid and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, um, oils on the skin. I mean, we can kind of do this inside out and we really have to couple it and be smart on what we're purchasing and getting the most bioavailable things possible because your body slows down. Right. Right. And one thing, actually, I just happened to think of this right now, and you probably know more about this, but, um, Mm -hmm. I, and I've been drumming this into my daughter is the um, sunscreen start it. Yes. Yeah. Because that is going to play a, a big, you're good. You can't do a whole lot about it in your fifties and sixties, but you know, all yeah. that time that you were sitting and letting your face burn in your twenties and thirties is going to come back and haunt you <laughs> later on. Not, yeah. 90%. So 90% of aging is actually from previous sun damage. And I remember when I worked in my first Aveda salon, I used to educate for Aveda And there was a woman and she wasn't even 30. She was like maybe 28. And I was like 21. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you are the most beautiful woman and you didn't even go in the sun. And at that time I was doing tanning boost and God forgive me because I have a brother that died (laughs) of skin cancer. Um, But, you know, I liked guys at that time. Well, I still do. (laughs) Um, Anyways, I remember thinking she's so wise. Like, how does she have all this like discipline to not go in the sun? And I kept thinking that's like that woman that's going to be like beautiful when she's like 80. And frankly, it's true. So my girls will leave this place out of the salon and they're, they don't use our mineral makeup. I say, if anything, use our mineral makeup because you Mm. get your four ingredients at all it is 50%. SPF and it is your number one mm-hmm. anti aging right. tool. Right. So you're right. Get her on the SPF. Yeah. No, and, <laughs> and yeah, and absolutely. So, I, you know, I think that's probably, I, I, I was thinking about that, thinking we can't really miss talking about that. But that's so right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is possible. I mean, I do have patients that come to see me and, and they actually are living pretty healthy lives and, you know, they're having menopausal symptoms. And yes, hormones do help sometimes with skin. Um, you know, and, and I have had people that really, they just, they feel when they stop their hormones that their skin did decline. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, we work on all the, all the, you know, the background, but some people do just feel better. And with regards to vaginal tissue health, mm-hmm. you know, when that estrogen is, is not there, those, those cells start to just shrivel up and that's also happening in the urinary tract. And so we start seeing more urinary tract infections. We start seeing more, um, pain after intercourse, um, 
or pain with intercourse and you know using things like whether it's DHEA or estriol which are probably estriol I probably use 90% of the time DHEA maybe 10% of the time using that vaginally a few days a week can be really helpful to kind of pump up those tissues again create more moisture in the tissues and it, it you know it significantly reduces that pain Okay. So question there. So, um, you know, uh, work with premier research lab, they have progesterone cream and, and some of those kind of products. And a lot of women can go and buy the yam and all those kind of things. Is there a safe, like, is it safe to go and buy organic USDA certified cream for vaginal health? Well, there's a lot of products out there, including like CBD products, but, um, what's safe and what's not safe. You know, I'm not actually, I, I don't know of any, um, I, I know that there's a few, I, I don't think you can just buy them directly online though. Okay. I wouldn't use progesterone vaginally um, for this purpose. Um, Estriol is not an FDA approved drug. It's, you know, it's a, um, it's widely used in Europe. We can use it in, you know, through compounding pharmacies. So no, you can't buy that over the counter. Um, DHEA, I have had people that have used even DHEA tablets vaginally. Mm -hmm. And for some that has worked. And, you know, I, there's really no downside to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't seen it work in tough cases. Um, I think using uh, the creams that you can put in and that are more liposomal based that absorb right into those tissues is a little better. But, um, but I have, I have seen people use capsule forms or um, tablet forms of DHEA and just use them uh, intravaginally. But I can't say that the results are as good as um, using estriol or liposomal based products. Okay. Um, and yeah, you couldn't get estriol over the counter. I know that um, I was just at a conference and uh, Anna Kabeca has a, Dr. Kabeca has a website and I know she sells. She has her magic potion for the yeah, vaginal. In yeah. Fact, yeah. In fact, I brought home a, a sample of it, but. Uh, I've got plenty right here too, actually. Yeah. I hand them out to clients. It's like. <laughs> Vaginal yeah, magic, something. I don't, I don't know. know. If, I, I'm not. I haven't looked to see if you can buy that directly online. Yeah, you I can. That, can you? Okay. Yeah. And I, I know that there's a few other places that you can buy. Um, they're usually not hormone based. Usually right. not. Um, right. So I mean, now yeah, DHEA. Let's talk about that for a second, because yeah. DHEA is the precursor. Correct. Um, DHEA is a. Um, it, it it can become testosterone. Yeah. Right. Okay. So yeah, you and but, you know using it locally like that. I mean, to me, it, um, I, I don't see systemic levels. I mean, even the studies on vaginal estradiol, you really don't see a lot of systemic unless you're using it a lot. You know, I mean, I you can. I have had people when, when they have really severe symptoms. I'll usually with estriol do a loading dose where they use it every day for you know, seven to ten days, and then it's like one to three times a week or as needed after that. Um, and sometimes they'll have some breast pain, you know, if they, you know, might maybe by like day six, seven, and I'll just say, you know what, just drop back to your maintenance. Um, so it does, it can affect your tissues systemically. So you do have to be a little bit cautious about it. You probably do want to monitor um, those hormone levels periodically. Um, but yeah, I, I, I feel more comfortable using estriol than DHEA, but, you know, I use DHEA sometimes when um, patients are responding to the estriol. Okay. Great. So, so um, the vaginal cream that Dr. Cabana has is, um, she has DHEA, coconut oil, vitamin E, shea butter, and emu oil with a little okay. bit of rose stem cells. So really okay. the active in her product is, I'm is sure. DHEA, DHEA, which you can buy over the counter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. I was going to say, I thought there was a hormone in there, but yeah, it's not, it's not an estrogen. I don't think you can buy any estrogen based products. No, any, but no, which is probably a good thing. Yeah. So moving on then. So we've kind of talked about, you know, excess and excess oil production. We've kind of gone to the side of dryness and menopause and postmenopause. Now let's kind of jump into the biome, the gut biome, gut mm -hmm. health, and how like literally the biome, these little great abundant um, features in our, in our gut really actually help produce hormones and regulate hormones. And so let's talk about that link. Yeah. Well, um, so the gut in general, I mean, I, I always, whenever I'm talking about gut issues, I kind of go through a whole pattern. So the first thing is, what do you have to remove? You know, is there mm -hmm. some kind of an infection or Im imbalance in gut flora going on? Meaning, are you, are you growing too much yeast or um, uh, an opportunistic bacteria or 
um, you know, uh, and, and then what do you, if you, what do you need to remove with regards to foods? Oftentimes when I have people that come in with acne, I do food testing yeah. um, because there's usually a pretty high connection um, there. But, um, you know, the, 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 the next question then is what do you need to replace? Mm -hmm. And the replace is, um, are you absorbing your minerals? If you have low stomach acid, are, you know, we talked about the importance of these minerals with thyroid. There's importance of, um, you know, minerals in, in detoxification of estrogen as well. Um, but if you have, and B12, and so if you don't have adequate stomach acid, um, you're not absorbing those minerals and B vitamins very efficiently, including iron is a big one. And, and uh, you know, you sometimes see women who are really difficult to um, correct an iron deficiency. Oftentimes they have low stomach acid and you need to be working on that. Yeah. But then there's the other, you know, the other um, pancreatic enzymes and bile acids. So, you know, do you need to replace any of these? Um, to help with absorption of nutrients. And then there's that, um, you know, re-inoculation, the, the balance of probiotics and prebiotics. And, you know, and this is where, um, you know, probiotics are really important. You should, you know, we all have a different microbiome. Yours is different than mine, it's different than somebody else's, and it's based on your experiences throughout your life. So, um, you know, what probiotic is kind of a big question of, uh, you know, I don't know what's the right probiotic for you. What we're trying to do is we're trying to just improve the beneficial to try to crowd out the opportunistic or the negative bacteria. Um, and then prebiotics, things like fiber, inulin, mm -hmm. um, uh, these are things that are, I think of it as fertilizer, right? Mm -hmm. So you're just kind of throwing fertilizer on this, trying to help um, improve the environment so healthy bacteria can grow. And a, a good case study on this um, is, uh, in, it is, a, a baby who was put on antibiotics for years for a genetic issue or a congenital issue and ended up growing up to have chronic long-term acne issues. And as it turned out, um, the, you know, the issue wasn't to put antibiotics on the skin. The issue wasn't to uh, use a retinol based formula. The issue wasn't to give her oral antibiotics. The issue was really you've got to go back and do all this repair of damage to this mm -hmm. microbiome that happened um, very, very early in life. And, um, and so that becomes a much bigger issue. So yeah, you have to look again, going back to the, what do you need to remove? What do you need to replace? What, how, and how much re-inoculation do you need to do? And then repair, how do you repair all this damage? And, um, and, and that's kind of the steps. You have to go through all those steps to really see some benefits. So when you have those people that, um, you know, and, and again, these, these kind of situations can also be correlated with the high androgens. These don't mm -hmm. have to be overweight individuals that have, you know, insulin resistance. These can be what we call skinny fat people mm -hmm. that just are producing too much insulin and pr producing too much androgens. And, um, and now it's affecting their skin. So again, go back and start with the gut. Um, and so that's, you know, that's kind of uh, from an acne standpoint, you really, it's not just a matter of what do I do to treat this, these lesions? Or, you know, some people will come in and say, I think this is just a hormone imbalance and I just want my hormones checked. It's going to go beyond that, I guarantee you, because if your hormones are imbalanced, there's a reason for it. So we're going to have to look deeper. Um, and especially when these people come in and I hear histories of, yeah, I took uh, antibiotics for three years for acne. Okay, so let's start there. <laughs> you know, that's what yeah. you did to treat the symptom actually made the problem a bigger problem long term for you. So, yeah, one of the things that we do a lot, like if we see a client come in that's on all of these medications for acne, and a lot of them, to be honest with you, are in their mid 20s and very, very early 30s, where they're still kind of getting over that hormonal hump of mm -hmm. kind of hearing just this beginning phase of outside of puberty and stress and, and things of that nature. And I always encourage them to make sure that, you know, you're supplementing the, with the right, like you were talking about in the first part is the micronutrients mm -hmm. and the macronutrients to support the skin as you go on these, you know, harsher mm -hmm. 
medications, you know, and then you have to think about, okay, well, did you ask your doctor how long they're going to keep you on it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we kind of want to look at this phase and the cycle that you're doing it. If you have to do it, then that's okay. If you're comfortable with that, but then how do we do phase out of it? How do we detoxify it? And then how do we resupplement the the gut? Because it's kind of like you're talking about stomach acid. You're kind of going in there and like totally clearing everything out and your garden has nothing to really grow to kind of support once you go off of it. So of course you're going to have a trigger response. So it's kind of this push pull back and forth. So I think being proactive and working with someone like yourself, really determining what are the imbalances and slowly going about and correcting the lifestyle issue is always the first thing in the gut, which is, you know, our gut, gut brain, gut skin, um, gut scalp. I mean, I can often determine a scalp issue and gut imbalances based on different like bacteria or different Mm -hmm. scents and smells or candida. Mm -hmm. Um, These are also symptoms that I've also come accustomed to realizing in patterns with women too. So yeah, that is many things. So correcting that first is critical and key. Right. And you know, there are people, I do have several patients that, um, stress plays a big factor here. Always Mm -hmm. stress always plays a role. And for some people, the constant acne is very stressful. And yes. you know what? I don't hold it against them for wanting to try, say, spironolactone um, yep. you know, if they have high insulin issues or, um, you know, or metformin or, you know, topicals or, you know, retinol kind of things or birth control pills. I mean, if it's what you need to get through, but if mm-hmm. that's the end point, you're not fixing the cause. You're just mm-hmm. fixing the symptom. And so you do want to look, especially, you know, if you're taking birth control pills for the purpose of your skin and not for birth control, um, you're going to have to deal with this. Is, there's a bigger issue going on. You're going to have to deal with it at some point. Yeah. Um, and so figure it out now. And, um, and then you won't have to use, um, you know, oral chemicals and oral medications long term to try to manage a skin issue that has a, a completely different root. Yeah. I always say write out a pro and con list, you know, Mm -hmm. and and you have to dump it out of your brain so that you can like extract your emotions from it because you have to look at the pros of taking what, let's just say birth control Mm -hmm. to determine a acneic skin. What are the pros and cons that you can't see 10 years down the road or 15 Mm -hmm. years down the road because every, we have a lizard brain, we get lazy to it, it becomes easy and it just, it regulates itself. Well, we forget do I want to have a family? Do I want to increase my risk of cancer? We have to really look at the truth and be analytical with our brain Mm -hmm. versus emotional with our brain and make good decisions for ourselves, even in the hottest hormonal hot flash, acneic zip popping moment, we have to really be smart as women and detach our emotions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, moving on, let's talk um, a little bit more about um, kind of some other areas about, we've, kind of, we've discussed um, a little bit about gut. Um, we tapped a little bit on food sensitivities, um, leaky gut, gut dysregulation. Um, you know, we talked about low HCL, gastric juices, candida, um, some other uncommon connections that, you know, we kind of connect to. And we had talked earlier this week um, about a woman that came into your office and this very, very intricate situation that she was in. Um, Maybe you can say a little bit about her labs and the, so we can kind of open up like the depth of how nuanced this can be, even though you feel okay, but you're just bloated all the time. Let's, let's dig into that story. Yeah. So, so, you know, I I always say to people when they come in for hair loss, it's probably one, it it can be very simple, but that's really rare. Mm -hmm. It, It more often than not becomes really complicated and you look at the obvious and sometimes you have to dig deeper. And, you know, there's also, there's always a financial connection with that because when you start to have to dig deeper, it costs money, you know, mm-hmm. it, to really look at what's really going on and to have some proof of what's really going on. And um, in the case of a patient of mine whose who's basic only complaints were hair loss and constant bloating, um, we had worked on, we looked at the thyroid, we worked on the nutritional management of her thyroid, we worked on um, the bloating, we looked for bacterial overgrowth, we, we went through the steps of remove, replace, re-inoculate, repair. Um, not, I mean, she had some kind of subtle additional symptoms, but this has been going on for years. We've tried food eliminations 
and she never really felt any different with these eliminations of foods. So we finally <clears throat> jumped into um, looking at an immune panel where we did some a look at her intestinal permeability. <clears throat> Even though she didn't have any autoimmune issues or anything like that, um, and she, we ended up finding out that yes, she has uh, high levels of zonulin, which meant she has um, intestinal permeability or leaky gut, um, and uh, LPS markers or like lip lipopolysaccharides, which means that there's a pathogen associated with that. And then in addition, we did a, a little complex um, panel um, that looks at all the different markers of um, gluten. And um, without getting into too much depth, she had a very specific marker that was elevated that was a gluten association with skin, and it affected skin and hair um, uh, health. And this has been going on the whole time. She never felt funny. Gluten or taking gluten away never affected her bloating. Um, obviously, with hair loss, it takes a long time to really see any change mm -hmm. there. So giving up gluten for a couple of months, you know, she probably didn't see much difference, and she never really did. But clearly, she had enough abnormal markers in all of these different um, uh, ways of looking at gluten that she probably should consider herself uh, celiac. I mean, she's not a true celiac, but she probably needs to give up gluten long term. And, um, and then we looked at another panel that was looking at all the cross-reactivity of gluten, all the gluten-contaminated foods, all the foods that are commonly consumed when you are on a gluten-free diet. What are the foods that we replace it with? and everything was lighting up, everything. And you get to a point where it's like, well, what is she supposed to eat? And really the answer is, first of all, you gotta give up gluten, you've gotta give up the, the big things that are showing up as, as you know, really elevated on this test. And then we have to really do some gut repair and also find out where is this lipopolysaccharide, what is the pathogen that's associated here? So next step, we did a pathogen panel and started to find mold markers were elevated. Never thought about mold. We were looking for bacteria all the time. Now we're waiting on a mycotoxin panel to see if we can identify the specific mycotoxin that is affecting her um, and that's creating all of this problem so we can you know, get her exposure, whether it's from food or the environment, it's hard to say. So this became a huge rabbit hole. And it's going to take a long time to repair. As it turns out, and I learned something new with this patient, she has kind of a syndrome, um, which is kind of an ultra-heightened immune response where she's creating antibodies to everything um, in her diet. And so you can't just have her stop eating. So you got to focus on the big issues first. And um, you really have to just take it step by step, get rid of the cause, you know, get rid of the triggers, which would be the mold, um, treat the mold. Uh, you know, if she has high mycotoxins in her symptom, we, in her system, we have to treat that. And in the whole the whole time we're doing this, we've got to keep her away from these, you know, basic foods. We're not even going to look at fruits and vegetables and and um, you know the, the good foods that she's eating because they're going to be lit up too. We can't take away everything, so we're going to look at the most inflammatory possibilities. So again, that's just kind of that worst case scenario case. But what started out as just a little bit of hair loss in her case has turned into be a much bigger issue. The benefit of knowing this, even though she's not feeling too badly, is she's one of these people that may at some point have some trauma, whether it's a physical trauma, like getting a car accident or um, uh, get really sick from a virus. Um, if she were to fracture a bone, um, she could very easily tip over into a huge autoimmune cascade. And so it hasn't happened yet. She's really done a lot with her stress management. She's really um, you know, she's really healthy in a lot of other ways, but okay, we started out with hair loss and look where we ended up and hopefully yeah. we'll prevent a, a long future of autoimmune health conditions for her right. just because of this discovery. And, um, and it took a long time and it took a lot of trial and error. We treated things, didn't have any success. We, you know, and it's going to be, you know, we still don't have success, mm -hmm. right? We're still in the process of treating. So, um, yeah, this so is a really key case of like unraveling the onion. Yeah. I mean, yeah. as a practitioner, these are the kind of caseloads that come in and you're and, and you really do kind of have to get a team around you of both facilitators that are getting the testing and kind of getting all great minds together to figure out, okay, mm -hmm. what do we start with to mm -hmm. keep her eating, to keep her out of inflammatory responses of everything that she does and just kind of get the fire out of the belly, the brain, everywhere so that yeah everything kind of settle down and start to regulate again. So mm -hmm. there's an extreme patience 
as a patient and um, as the practitioner to really work together and create an intimacy of trust Mm -hmm. that there are way deeper pieces of the puzzle that women, we women need help with um, Mm -hmm. at times. And, you know, going back to these kind of symptomatic things that is actually becoming an epidemic. And when I say epidemic, I mean skin sensitivities and skin reactions that women are having. How many women do you know that say, I just can't even be around perfume anymore? It Mm -hmm. makes me sick. I get a migraine headache. How many women do I have coming in and it's many that say, I'm losing my hair. It's just not as thick as it used to be. Now, Mm -hmm. to your point, there is very much a genetic piece in this. And Mm -hmm. I always say it's the 80-20 rule, 80%. Mm -hmm. And we validate and science says that 80% is your environment and 20% or less is your genetic coding. Okay. Mm -hmm. That means you have a lot more power than you think. But we Mm -hmm. also have to remember that we're four generations back. So you're carrying four generations back of mistakes and bonuses that our parents did or didn't do. And so we carry these genetic snips into what we have right now. So even working with you, going back to, well, what is your mother? What is your grandmother? We have to take those things into consideration. So, you know, with hair loss, with skin, these are all symptoms that something's not working in the body. Mm -hmm. And we can get really busy in the brain and really emotional, kind of like I was talking about. But again, as women, we need to step back, collect the information that we can, because we have all these really smart ways of doing so and being patient with practitioners like you and kind of going through it one Mm -hmm. by one and just being really analytical with our health and being smarter. Um, work smarter, not harder, you know. And it takes a while to see results when it, you know, when it comes to skin and hair, it's not like, oh, my energy is better today than it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. It it, it takes, or I've been sleeping well the last three nights. You're not going to see that kind of fast feedback. Yeah. So it takes, it takes a lot longer for results and that's for sure. And, you know, and you're right. Some people, you know, it's, it's a matter of, you know, how do you deal with reality? Uh, You know, I'm a great example of that. I have very thin, fine hair. My family, my mother, my sisters, we all have thin, fine hair. Um, The one in my family who's the worst is the one who back in, you know, in her high school days was putting bleach on her hair so she could be blonde. She has very little hair left. Mm -hmm. And so um, really all all you can do is try to, you know, improve the health of what you have, but Mm -hmm. I'm never going to have the hair that I see in other people. You know, I think that's a really good topic. I, and yeah. I've done your hair and it's, I, w- yeah. I miss doing your hair. Um, <laughs> but I knew, you know, when you had first yeah. sat in my chair, I always think first and foremost, if a client has thinning hair, I'm like, okay, stressors, mm-hmm. medications, antidepressants, mm-hmm. birth control. What, you know, what are those kind of things? I have the, a light discussion with them, the first and second appointment. And I knew with your hair that you, yeah. you very much were a genetic type hair loss. It was diffused kind of evenly around. It has mm-hmm. been like this consistently. And I have a few clients like that. We do hair extensions mm-hmm. in, and yeah. I'd like to sell them everything in my kit and caboodle, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I know realistically it's a genetic thing for them. So it's right. something that they have to come to terms and come to peace with. Right. So there's a lot of different medications that women can take when we're talking about hair loss. One, I want to just kind of brief on minoxidil and the other one, finasteride. And so a lot of women um, will shop on the internet. You can get it over the counter at 3%, the 5% you have to get prescribed. But um, I just kind of want to go over these. So women are really aware of the plus and minus of these when they are freaking out about hair loss. And minoxidil is actually um, a blood pressure reducer. So they lower blood pressure. So what does that do for the hair and the follicle? It helps basically bring a lot of blood flow back into the, to the cuticle rounding and create more nutrients to kind of get into that area. We don't know exactly why it works other than what it does for that mechanism, but there are also unfortunately a slew of side effects that can come with it. Um, and then if you're taking an abundance of it, 5%, and you're taking a lot of it, you'll actually have internal issues and women will have anything from headaches to blurred vision right. to feeling really nauseous. So that's minoxidil. The other one is finasteride. And so this is actually reduces androgens in the body. So you're reducing androgens and by inhibiting the enzyme that converts it, but then you're also still, you're still kind of dancing with fire on your 
the downstream symptoms of high testosterone and DHT. Mm -hmm. So there's pluses and minuses to taking these. Short term is the plus is that you'll have a little bit of hair growth or say what you have. The minus is when you stop using it, you will have possible side side effects and symptoms and the hair will continue to the loss that it had prior to taking. Not long term. Yeah. It's, I mean, if that's your, if that's your plan, that's a long-term commitment and long-term medications come with long-term side effects. And so you have to go into, and into any medication knowing that, um, there, there is no magic pill. Um, so, um, I have a magic pill. Uh, CBD? <laughs> well, CBD helps. And you know what? That's a great topic you bring up, Julie, because I wanted to talk about, well, I do want to talk about a really realistic option. And women get really confused from Aveda and Vadi to yeah. all these different hair supplements and really weird websites on the internet with like mm-hmm. big male heads with like hair missing. And they're like, eh. Yeah. Um, our root revival hair growth system by far is the most multi-therapeutic system that I have seen on the market. Um, our topical active is Redensil, which is used at 3%. It's the only regenerative medicine product on the market that is proven to work. And it's two times more powerful than minoxidil. Mm -hmm. Um, and virtually no side effects at all. It's got four ingredients in it. And then we, you know, bring about it a lot of protein, amino acids, lysine, zinc, macro, micronutrients. And so basically what we want to look at ladies, if we're trying to bring, um, we're doing the internal with Julie, I I truly believe going back to this, um, bioavailable nutrient density, we have to use topicals as women, as we get older, because we need that additional support. So topically what the, um, activator does with the shampoo and conditioner is it goes in and it helps the apoptosis and the cellular division with stem cell in the scalp. And so we need that divide in the scalp to grow new hair. So it's going to lengthen the growth phase and shorten the fallout phase in those three different, you know, phases of hair growth. And what women don't understand is that you can have hair growth phase of the hair actually between anywhere, and this goes back to genetics, from two years to seven years. So this is the answer why some women can only, I can only grow my hair like to my shoulders and it stops growing. That's a genetic situation where some women can have hair down to their butt and they have a seven-year growth phase. So how do we create an ecosystem on the scalp in the most healthy way possible that we can use longevity wise with no side effects and actually works. Our root revival growth hair loss system is by far, I have seen it work for seven years behind my chair and there are answers, but something as simple as just pea protein or putting a bunch of salicylic acid on the scalp so that you can scrub off any kind of excess sebum or product on the scalp. It's just agitating and it's certainly not dealing with an inflammatory issue on the scalp, which is also related to hair loss. So there are strategic products out there. If you have any questions, just let me know. But I wanted to at least go through, and I'm sure you see a lot of this with the minoxidil, the finasteride. I mean, these are pharmaceuticals that have been making money for years, but let me tell you, there's alternatives. Right. No. And when it comes down to, I mean, you're the expert on the products and, um, you know, and, and that's usually what I do. In the meantime, you got to clean up what you're using and look for better options. And that's when I would send somebody to you to, to talk about what the options are for, for products, mm-hmm. because that, that can be a very overwhelming for people to stand and look at a shelf full of things and say, I don't really know what's best for me. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the, the products out there for thin hair are, they're not that great. As you said, mm-hmm. it's not the right approach. So yeah, it's a money making market. As yeah. far as hair loss or skin or um, you know topics that clients come in, Julie, is there anything else that you want to share as far as hormonal related, and just kind of some really practical things that you know we kind of understand the intricacies we've reviewed over excess estrogen can be hair loss and oily skin. Too little estrogen and malproduction of hormones can relate in dryness and hair loss as well. There's these two different paradigms that we can both be on. 
and finding that sweet spot, we're always trying to presume balance in our life. Is there anything else that you can kind of bring to the table that is in your heart as far as relating to these topics for women? No, I, I would say that the biggest thing, like I said, a lot of times the hair loss issue is the one thing that when, when a person comes in and their primary concern is hair loss, come in knowing that it's, it may, chances are pretty good that it's not going to be a simple solution. Um, you have to really look deeper at what's going on systemically. Um, stress, and you know, we talked about this briefly. Um, you know, I actually had a patient who had gone through chemotherapy, lost all of her hair, um, and this was many, many years ago. She lost all of her hair, it grew back, and then she had another scare. And she didn't have a, a recurrence of her cancer, but shortly after that recurrence, her hair fell out again. And that was just what we, it's a condition called telogen effluvium, and it's, it's, um, it's related to just a stressful event. And sometimes when people are not managing their cortisol well, or there's a lot of stress in their lives, the hair loss is going to be a part of that. And so, you know, I think the biggest takeaway here is it's not a simple fix. There's so many possibilities. Um, and, you know, you can read a lot about one and kind of hope it's as simple as that, but more often than not, it's, it's not going to be. And if it is, you're very lucky. <laughs> if yeah. it is that simple, you're really lucky. Yeah, I agree. And my heart really aches for women because we really do bear the cross for so many things in our life. And we take on, you know, just talking about the mindset because stress, you know, these are stresses of stress becomes an organic stressor in the body in which, you know, cortisol Let's talk about cytokines in the skin. Well, cytokine then creates a trigger in the skin, which then makes acne. You know, it's an inflammatory response that's trying to, you know, warn the body and it ends up in acne in the skin. And when a client comes in and has a really stressful event and they're coming into me and they're like, all of a sudden I started losing my hair and they can't really diagnose it at the moment. I always say, what happened to you three months ago? Because it goes back to that 28 day cycle. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we have to, again, be our own detectives. Yeah. 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 So, you know, closing up the gut, healing the gut, healing meditation, getting enough sleep at night, drinking enough water, <laughs> um, finding practitioners such as Miss Beautiful Julie Teppen. Um, you know, we need support systems and um, treating ourselves with love and how we talk to ourselves, I think is probably the best way we can do that because mm -hmm. if we're beating ourselves up all the time, how are we going to make that gap from, well, you're not worth it to mm -hmm. going and spending money on an incredible practitioner like you that's going to cut their time in half and their headache in half to getting the resolve and the results they want in their life so they can mm -hmm. less themselves and others. And maybe find ways to fix more than just hair loss. Yeah. A lot of times, there's a lot more going on that they didn't even realize. And, oh, and they, yeah. Yeah. Has nothing to do with hair loss. <laughs> that's just a <laughs> symptom leading you to. <laughs> no, that's great. Well, Julie, I always end the podcast with, is there anything that you have personally, even since the last time we talked, that has awakened you in the last uh, month in your life that you would want to share with our guest today? Yeah, you ask me that every time. Just since I talked to you last, um, um, you know, I have to say, you know, I'm I'm heading into that menopause transition myself, and you know, I've I've been helping women through it for years, and you can do, you know, you can know a lot about hormones, and things still happen that you know, you just kind of go, hmm, you know, I, I thought I was doing a pretty good job with that, and apparently. I'm not. And, um, and so, you know, you, you can do everything right and things can still malfunction. Um, it's a, it's an interesting transition. Um, and so you just have to take it day by day and you have to, um, not, like you said, not beat yourself up. You have to keep your stress levels low. You have to kind of keep moving forward and, and keep saying, you know what, these could be the best years of my life. Um, there's a lot of positive about, you know, being in your fifties and your sixties nowadays. Um, it's, you know, it's very freeing in a lot of ways. And I, you know, I waited until this stage to start my own business and start my own practice. And, um, 
you know, it, it, it's actually, I feel like uh, stress levels have reduced and not increased, even though this is a new business. And so I think that, you know, I, I, I guess the takeaway is as much as I know about hormones, um, no one's perfect. And it, it, there's nothing wrong with having to ask for help when you go through this transition, even if you think you're doing everything right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do everything right. And like you said, you still have to bear it and run through it and be in the best mindset possible. And you are an incredible woman and you're an incredible practitioner. And I'm so proud of you for starting this business at the righteous young age you are. Uh, I truly do believe the 50 is the new 30. I mean, I have so many women that say, I feel better now than I did when I was in my 30s. So many women say that. So yeah. we're on the uphill, ladies. And, you know, I recently got certified in hypnosis. And my main goal of that is um, to do also what you do, Julie, is to really help awaken women um, to come in out of this trance that we've been in for so long, that we're victims, that we can't take hold of our, of our lives and, and figure out what's going on and have hope that we can resolve these issues so, because we certainly can. I mean, we're in the most abundant age that we've ever lived of technology and nutrients and superfoods that are available to us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's all positive. It's all good. So I really want to, I want to thank you again for being on the Awaken Beauty podcast. Uh, where can we find you? Um, best place to find me is at my website, Julie Tebben, J-U-L-I-E-T-E-B-B-E-N-C-N-P for certifiednursepractitioner.com. Awesome. And, Thank you. And my website is finally completed. Lots of information there about what I do and, um, and, and how. So. Awesome. Well, everybody, make sure that you go over and give Miss Julie a visit. And I will have all the show notes here for you today. Uh, and, you know, ladies, Awaken Beauty listeners, I know that you and I know that women long for less noise and you want more effective conversations like the one that we had here today on the Awaken Beauty podcast. And I think I can join you and Julie can join you in just saying there's just too much of everything. So I encourage you to slow down, be an analytical thinker of your own thoughts, how you nourish and build your garden, both inside your gut and inside your mind. Um, you know, a lack of good products is really not the issue that we deal with with women. It's a matter of the right products that work for you and finding the right practitioners that work for you like Miss Julie. So, you know, it starts with consistency and it starts at getting at the root. And so if you're looking for organic and natural products or the root revival system that I had mentioned, make sure you go over to evokebeauty.com. That's E-V-O-Q beauty.com. I want to thank you for listening to the Awaken Beauty podcast today. Make sure you go to iTunes, five star, leave a review of your key insight that you took from Julie today. And until next time, stay sane, get sleep and bring your sexy back. <laughs>